I make them laugh, I make them cry. Laugh with the lectures, cry with the final examination. Uh, there is a problem set, which is fairly trivial. It's mainly to familiarize you with uh, manipulating Dirac matrices, which we will have to do a lot of within the next few, few lectures. Uh, are there any questions about the last lecture? Yes, sir. Uh, if you plus transforms according to D1 half 0, can you show explicitly? D0 1 half, I believe. Okay, could you show explicitly that the adjoint transforms the other one? Well, the complex conjugate is the same thing as the adjoint. Just the adjoint just means we arrange those two fields as a row vector rather than a column vector. Oh, doesn't that imply then that the D matrix is symmetric or something like that? No. No, no, no. When I write adjoint, I'm just, I've got the same two sets of fields. So just by saying adjoint, I've got a particular convention for summing things up in an expression like u adjoint u. You want to show the complex conjugate transforms according to the opposite representation. Okay. The adjoint is the complex conjugate just rewritten with a certain notational convention that makes summation simpler. Well, okay, sure. So we'll start out with one case. Do e to the minus i sigma That's our starting point. Now a complex conjugate. So this is an answer to a question. I'll do it over the equations I've written here. So the sigmas are not all real, and the plus i goes into minus i. Is that okay? Now I'll use an identity that is um, easy to prove. That's, of course, trivial because sigma y is the only imaginary sigma matrix and also the only sigma matrix that commutes rather than anti-commuting with sigma y. Okay. Now we'll make a similarity transformation, an equivalence transformation using sigma y. E the plus i sigma star e theta over 2 sigma y, or equivalently sigma y inverse. That's our SS inverse. Equals, bring the sigma y upstairs, as I can do, since sigma y squared is 1. I can stick it in, in between every factor in the power series expansion. E the minus i sigma dot e theta over 2. OK, that part, if that were all there would be there, would be the formal proof that the representation d1 half of the rotation group is equivalent to its complex conjugate. Okay, a known fact already. Now what happens to the acceleration? So else the same manipulation. Here it is equivalent to the matrix with a minus sign in here, which is what is the appropriate for the transformation properties of u minus. Thus, I have not lied to you. U minus, u, u plus star transforms in a way equivalent to the way u minus transforms, equivalent under a, after a change of basis. You have to complex conjugate and multiply by sigma y to put things in standard form. Okay. Are you happy with that satisfactory answer? Are there further questions? Okay. Um, 
Well, it's a vector under rotations. Yeah, I don't understand why it's a vector under rotations. Well, it's a candidate. Its fourth component is a scalar under, its time component is a scalar under rotations. That's from physics 251. For a theory of poly spinners, U adjoint U is a scalar under rotations. And U adjoint sigma U is a vector under rotations. If you don't remember that, just work it out for a typical component along the same lines we worked it out in class for the boost. Okay. Are there other questions? Now, this is going to be one of our dull, but I hope comprehensible lectures, because having derived the Dirac equation at the end of last lecture, I'm now just going to manipulate it and write, study a solutions, write it in a thousand different bases, and write a thousand different notational conventions, all of which are excruciatingly dull, but which have the aim of automating the free Dirac equation. So later on, when we have to do complicated things with it, put, make it part of an interacting quantum field theory, we'll be able to do it efficiently by using, a, uh, using funny symbols. Power through funny squiggles. Okay, onwards. The Dirac equation in the for form we found it last time had a Lagrangian psi adjoint g naught psi plus psi adjoint alpha dot grad psi and an i here also minus m psi adjoint psi where m was a positive real number. Alpha was sigma minus sigma zero zero, and a beta here. Beta was zero one one zero, and psi in terms of our u pluses and u minuses was u plus u minus. The um, <coughs> This, um, the, uh, of course, we can write the generators of uh, Lorentz boosts and rotations in terms of um, these matrices alpha and beta. The Lorentz boost generator, M, is simply I alpha over 2 because it's I sigma over 2 for the U plus and minus I sigma over 2 for the U minus. The um, Lorentz generators it can be written, of course, as always. Oh, sorry, not Lorentz. The rotation generators are always and forever given by this formula. Equivalently, L equals one half sigma sigma zero zero. That is to say, the uh, two u plus and u minus transform in the same way under rotations. And finally, we can write parity, which, as you recall, changes u plus and u minus in the form psi of x and t goes into beta psi of minus x and t. <clears throat> this form of the uh, Dirac equation is, of course, dependent on choosing a particular basis, that is to say, arranging u plus the two components of u plus and the two components of u minus into a four component object in the standard in a certain way. These equations up here with the explicit form of alpha, beta, etc., depend on this. These equations here and these equations here don't. If we had arranged the four, if we had made a similarity transformation, if we had put u plus and u minus together to make um, for a uh, different uh, four component object in a different way the explicit forms of alpha beta and l would be changed but these equations would not be changed 
they would just be alpha, beta, and L in the new basis. A base, the, this particular basis is called, in fact, the word representation is used, which is a bit strange since it doesn't really have that much to do with group theory. This is called the vial representation of the Dirac equation, where I put u plus and u minus together in this way and obtain these explicit forms for alpha and beta. It is not the representation in which Dirac first wrote down the equation. Dirac first wrote down the equation in a race representation in which psi is 1 over root 2, u plus plus u minus, u plus minus u minus. In such a representation, it is easy to see that the 1 over root 2 is inserted of necessity so that this term, which has no Dirac matrix in it, will have the same form. In this term form, it is easy to see that alpha is off diagonal, and beta is diagonal, block diagonal. L is still Since, since u plus and u minus transform in the same way under rotations, the, uh, their sums and differences also transform like ordinary poly spinners. This set of equations defines what is called the standard representation. Standard just for historical reasons. It was the one first written down by Dirac. Aside from those lines of equations which have the arrows on them, everything else is the same in the, Dirac in the standard representation and the vial representation. I don't expect you to see offhand that this is what alpha and beta looks like, but you can check it in a moment just by plugging them into this formula here and seeing you get the same quadratic forms as a function of u plus and u minus. You can do that in some moment when you're bored with what I'm saying. <laughs> The uh, standard representation is especially convenient for finding solutions to the Dirac equation in explicit form for uh, a small momenta for going to the limit p space part of p goes to zero because in that limit is the beta part of the equation that's significant, and we have diagonalized beta in this representation. Let me work this out explicitly. Let me look for a plane wave solution. I alpha, sorry. I d naught plus I alpha dot grad psi equals beta m psi. I choose psi. For the first instance, I will look at solutions, so-called positive frequency solutions, because they have a negative term in the exponential. Some function u of p e to the minus i p dot x, those solutions which we would expect in the quantum theory to multiply annihilation operators. The uh, u sub p, not to be confused with the u plus or u minus, is the coefficient, since we already know all solutions of the Dirac equation obey the uh, Klein-Gordon equation with mass m. We need p0 can be chosen to be e sub p, which is the square root of p squared plus m squared. <coughs> Plugging this into this expression, the i and the minus i cancel, and I obtain e sub p minus alpha dot p, sign change coming from the metric, u sub p equals beta m 
u sub p. In the standard representation, this equation is particularly easy to solve when p equals 0. In that case, it becomes, this becomes m, this becomes 0, things cancel, and we obtain u sub p equals beta u sub 0, I should call it, u sub 0. This equation has, of course, uh, two solutions. <laughs> u sub r0, <coughs> r equals 1 and 2. And I will write them down explicitly. u10, for example, is, aside from a normalization convention, 1000. And u20 equals 0, 1, 0, 0. I will insert a rather peculiar looking normalization convention. for reasons that will become clear shortly. Square root of 2m. <clears throat> this, uh, by reasoning identical to that used, reasoning by guesswork identical to that used but for the vial equation, this uh, should be associated with the annihilation operator for a particle at rest with momentum 0 and j sub z equals plus 1 half. Particle, what would we call a particle in this equation? Well, it's rather like an electron, so I'll call it an electron. Electron this is the same thing with j sub z equals minus one half. Of course, that's the real reason we have two solutions. We have a theory of mass of particles with spin one half. And therefore, if we, we cannot get by with more than two sol with less than two solutions for each value of the momentum. The um, U's are uh, norm so it's easy to find solutions for particles. I'll talk about the uh, solutions that would be associated with creation operators, antiparticle creation operators, positron creation operators, as it were, in a moment. But let's continue playing with these for a while. <coughs> these solutions are normalized so that you are adjoint not us not equals 2m delta rs. And not having nothing to do with the normalization, but just with the fact that uh, alpha is a block off diagonal matrix, um, you are adjoint not alpha us not equals zero. <coughs> Rs equals one and two. I will not always use these two solutions called u1 and u2 because I may not be interested in the z-axis. Maybe I'm interested in the x-axis. <laughs> However, I will always and forever normalize my solutions so that this normalization convention holds. Any linear combination of these will be just as good. The fact that these are particularly chosen to be eigenstates of spin along the z direction is something I will sometimes change to make another cal do another calculation. <coughs> so much for, let's say I want to preserve these equations. So much for uh, solutions at rest. Those are easy. What about moving solutions? Solutions associated with non-zero p. Those look like we have to solve a more complicated equation to construct them. But actually, we don't have to solve that equation at all. The theory has been constructed to be Lorentz invariant. 
So let's exploit its Lorentz invariance and obtain a solution associated with a non-zero p by applying a Lorentz transformation to a solution associated with a zero p. Therefore, I define URP equals alpha um, uh, dot E phi over 2, where I will choose E UR0. That is a Lorentz boost along an axis E by an angle phi, a hyperbolic angle phi. E is, of course, to be chosen to boost the particle at rest in the direction of the desired momentum P. And phi is to be chosen to boost it by the right amount, that is to say, such that cos phi equals E sub P. And of course, we're interested in the positive sign of phi. We want to boost it along the direction of P, not opposite to the direction of P. <clears throat> Thus, we construct, if you don't believe me, plug this formula into that thing and see that it does give a solution. Thus, we construct a solution with momentum uh, associated with momentum p. The normalization conditions obeyed by these equations, by these uh, solutions, are, are rather trivial, since these two equations I have written down form, of course, the space and time components of a four vector. And therefore, yes, sir? E sub p over m. Thank you. Certainly. It's m that goes into m cosh phi. Yes, right. <laughs> also, I want phi to be 0 when e sub p equals f. <laughs> the, the, um, the nor since these are the four components of a uh, four vector, what happens to this thing after the boost is trivial. <laughs> Just to show how this works out, let me do it in an especially uh, simple case. I'm sorry, whoops, sorry, wrong. <laughs> sorry, 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 I got carried away with the grace of just putting lines on there. <laughs> That's the Lorentz transform of that four vector. Uh, the um, the um, Let's work out an explicit case, since we have an explicit expression for the alphas, of E moves in the z direction, so that the particle is moving in the positive z direction. Then the relevant quantity is alpha z equals this. We note that a square is 1. Alpha z squared is 1. And therefore, it's easy to compute e to the phi alpha z over 2. The relevant matrix is cosh phi over 2 plus alpha z cinch phi over 2. Cosh phi over 2 is square root of 1 plus cosh phi over 2, 
which happens to be square root of m plus e sub p over square root of 2m. <clears throat> Cinch phi over 2 square root of cosh phi minus 1 over 2 is square root of e sub p minus m over square root of 2m. And now you see the reason why I put a square root of 2m in here, to cancel out those ugly denominators. <coughs> Did I make a mistake? Uh, 2p. Yeah, 2p, 2p. You're right. Sorry. 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 Happens. Thank you. Thus we find that u1, for example, p, for this particular case, is the Koch term gives me square root of e sub p plus m, 0. Then from alpha itself, I get sigma z acting on this thing, this one here, brings it down and gives me square root of e p minus m, 0. A nice thing about this formula and this way of normalizing things is this has a smooth limit as m goes to 0, of course, although, of course, the method we have used to define these functions does not have a smooth limit as m goes to 0. And thus, we can smoothly take the limit if we wish as the particle mass becomes negligible, either because we're doing uh, neutrino physics or something like that, or because we're doing a process where an electron gets produced, but it gets produced to such a high energy that its mass is negligible. Uh, this normalization convention I have adopted with the square root of 2m is not that of Bjorkane and Drell, although they mention it in their text as an alternative normalization convention. I adopt this one for precisely this reason, that you can go, they don't put in the square roots of 2m's, and therefore they have to set up a special sequence of rules when they're discussing neutrino theory. I, uh, I adopt this one so I don't have to do that. Is everything we're doing in the standard representation? Yes, everything in, at the stage is in the standard representation. <laughs> Although, of course, those formulas that do not involve explicit uh, um, uh, expressions for the actual components of things like this or this, say a formula like this or a formula like this is true in any representation. If it doesn't involve the explicit expression for the alphas and the u's, it would be true in any representation of the Dirac equation. But when things, when I actually write out explicitly four components, then I'm working in a particular representation. Of course, um, everything I say goes through mutatis mutandum for the negative energy solutions. There I write things this way, where again, call, they are called Vs. P0 is, again, E sub P. These are expected to be, uh, I, um, to, we expect these when we finally quantize this theory to multiply creation operators, creation operators for the antiparticles of electrons, positrons as they are conventionally called. The, um, we plug this into the Dirac equation and get an almost identical equation 
p sub p minus alpha dot p v sub p equals minus the reflection of the fact that the Once again, the solution is most easily done in the case when p equals 0. v0 equals minus beta m v0. Thus, the um, negative energy solutions, negative energy, negative frequency solutions, no M, thank you. The negative frequency solutions have, are, are uh, I can choose to be two in number. For example, in the standard representation, this, um, because we expect these to be the coefficients of creation operators rather than annihilation operators, the same sign switch that occurs for a, when we were discussing helicity, occurs here. And we would expect this to multiply the creation operator for a positron with j sub z equals minus 1 half. Uh, yes, um, square root of 2m, square root of 2m. <laughs> is that not the square root of 2? That hmm? Is that the square root of 2? What? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't, well, if, did I make a mistake? Tell me. Huh? <laughs> Fine, with the same normalization factor thing. And this creates a positron with jz equals plus a half. The switch occurs for the same reason that the sign switch occurred in the helicity problem of last lecture. This is supposed to multiply a creation operator, and therefore the phase of the helicity gets switched because the state is on the right, on the left rather than the right. Question? Uh, where, where do you make these associations? Or you were saying that you sort of remember the I'm guessing that the solutions with this sort of time dependence, which I erased, yes, with this sort of time dependence will, will multiply a, will be a creation, an, a creation operator for a particle of momentum p, and the other one will be an annihilation article, operator for a particle of momentum p, and since it's a charge field, they should create an annihilate particle and antiparticle. So as far as we're looking at this problem right now, this is just a classical field. This is just a classical field, and this is just a guess about what we should expect in the quantum theory. Okay. But there's a sign, just as in the case of the, of the Weyl equation. But I just wanted to make those guesses so we'd have some idea of how these classical solutions, it'll turn out the guesses are right. <laughs> yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have some idea about how the uh, we'll have some idea about how uh, what this is associated with. I wanted to be slight, perhaps slightly belabor the sign switch because frequently people I see people doing students doing computations of which they say, well, this one is upstairs, so therefore it's associated with a particle with j z equals plus one half. That's not true. It's associated with a particle with jz equals minus one half because the particle is on the other side in the matrix element of the field operator. <coughs> of course, the, uh, we define moving solutions in exactly the same way as before. E to the alpha phi dot e over 2 v sub 0. Where this is the same of phi and the same e as before. And uh, we have the normalization condition among the v's. I'll just write down the time component.
that suffices to express the normalization. Uh, oops, keep doing it. Same mistake, same mistake. Stereotype behavior. <laughs> One of the classical clinical signs that someone is going bananas. Okay. <laughs> 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 yes, I have four, four, four eyebrows that meet, yes. <laughs> Those are the signs of a werewolf, isn't it? Yeah. No, yes. Uh, yes, no, also the first, and for a werewolf, the first and second fingers are at the same length. <laughs> okay. The, the, um, you learn all sorts of things in physics, 253. <laughs> yes. the, um, now, so much for the Dirac equation and the solutions. We discussed uh, two representations. I would now like to begin another topic, also connected with the Dirac equation. We discussed um, two possible um, representations in which of the Dirac matrices. Of course, there are many, an infinite number. Any 4 by 4 matrix defines a, uh, can be used to transform to a new representation of the Dirac matrices, the alphas and the betas. But there are some properties <coughs> of the Dirac matrices. Well, I might as well start afresh. <coughs> that are independent of one's choice of bases. One is a curious algebra they obey. And algebra, let me write down them, the direct matrices, say, in the file representation. Certain algebra, algebra set of algebraic relations called uh, the Dirac algebra. Alpha i and alpha j anti commute, and the square of each alpha is plus one. So I can write this equation <coughs> where the curly brackets indicate the anti commutator, the sum of the products in the two different orders. Beta anti commutes with alpha. And beta squared equals 1. That is to say, we have a set of four 4 by 4 matrices, all of which anti commute with each other, and each of which has square 1. There is a theorem which I will prove to the Pauli. set of 4 by 4 matrices obeying these equations are equivalent to these. That is to say, actually, the entire structure of the theory is uh, embedded in these algebraic equations. Uh, if we write down any set of 4 by 4 matrices that obey these things, they define physically the same Dirac equation as any other set of 4 by 4 matrices. It's merely a matter of choice of basis for the four components of the uh, Dirac field. Uh, <clears throat> before I prove uh, the theorem, does everyone understand the statement of the theorem? The proof I'll use is not the one given by uh, Pauli, but uh, one based on our analysis of uh, the uh, representations of the Lorentz group, since that's an easier, since we already have a lot of theory there we can use. 
Therefore, the proof goes as follows. Define mi equals i alpha i over 2. Define li by mi mj equals minus i epsilon ijk lk. I will now prove that the m's and the l's defined this way as a consequence of the Dirac algebra, the sequence of anti-commutation relations, obey the commutation relations required for a generator for the, of a representation, for the set of generators of a representation of the Lorentz group. Yes? Uh, in general, 4 by 4 matrices, it would have to be a maximum 16 dimensional. There are uh, 12. Yeah, there are, there are 12 constraints there, so if you just prove There are 16 constraints. Let's see, 9 plus 3. Oh, sorry. No, uh, let's see. There are... Uh, no, no, no. They're, they're, let's see. I have anti-commutators which are symmetric among the four of them. So I have 10 equations. Four equations for when i equals j and six equations for when i is not equal to j. Okay. Okay. Careful, you were about to prove that they were all equal to that. <laughs> so that also don't remember there's a 16 parameter group of possible similarity transformations since I can make an US can be any 4x4 four four matrix. <laughs> when, I, when I make the transformation alpha prime equals S alpha S inverse. It's not that... Uh, Counting parameters doesn't, is not particularly helpful in this problem. Now, let me prove that these obey the uh, equations, the commutation relations characteristic of a representation of the Lorentz group. The uh, MM commutator is, of course, true by definition. Let's use it to determine one of the components of, um, of L. Let's take x. Minus i lx equals my commutator mz equals minus 1 quarter alpha x alpha y minus alpha y alpha x alpha y and alpha x, uh, sorry, y, z. Alpha y and alpha z anti-commute, so this is minus 1 half alpha y, alpha z. So I have lx equals minus i over 2, alpha x, alpha y, alpha z. And the other L's, L, y, and L, z, are, of course, given by cyclic permutations. Yeah, because I've divided by plus i to produce minus i. Now let's check a typical commutator, say L, x, with M, y. If we get this one right, we'll get the others by cyclic Y. There's an I and a minus I, so that's plus one quarter. LX is alpha Y, alpha Z, alpha Y. That's MY minus alpha Y, alpha Y, alpha Z. Alpha Y and alpha Z anti-commute. So therefore, I can bring the alpha y through the alpha z, and I get minus 1 half alpha y, alpha y, alpha z. Alpha y squared is 1, so that's minus 1 half alpha z, which I see by looking up there is <coughs> um, 
LX MY minus one half is I M Z, which is, of course, the right result for LX with MY. Let's check a typical XY, a typical LL commutator. LX LY equals minus one quarter because both I's have the same sign. Alpha Y, Alpha Z, Alpha X, Alpha Y. Al sorry, wrong again. That's X all right, but Y is uh, do, 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 ZX. Alpha Z, Alpha X minus. This is so boring, I'm falling asleep myself. <laughs> alpha Z, Alpha X. <laughs> Alpha Y, Alpha Z. Uh, alpha Z squared is 1. And the Alpha Z here goes through both an Alpha X and an Alpha Y, which is two cha sign changes. So this is minus 1 quarter. The first term is Alpha Y, Alpha X. The second term is minus alpha x alpha y, which is also alpha x alpha y, alpha y alpha x. So, and this is revealed to be <coughs> i times lz by the definition of lz. <coughs> Thus, all the commutators check. And if I just start out with four, four by four matrices obeying this, I generate from them a four-dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. Now, there are many four-dimensional representations of the Lorentz group. For example, there are three half zero and one half one half. But uh, none of these can be the right one because L sub z squared, for example, is minus 1 quarter alpha x, alpha y, alpha x, alpha y. I bring the x through the y, giving a minus sign, and everything else gives me plus 1, so I get plus 1 quarter. So it must be a representation that contains only LZ equals um, uh, plus 1 half and minus 1 half as the eigenvalues of LZ. There are thus three possibilities at this stage from our general theory. D1 half 0 of lambda plus D1 half 0 of lambda, D0 1 half of lambda plus D0 1 half of lambda and d0 1 half of lambda plus d1 half 0 of lambda. Those are the only four dimensional representations of the Lorentz group that have the fact that they only contain Lz squared, Lz equals plus or minus 1 half. Yes, question, Martin. That's right. That's going to, beta is going to be used to pull out one of these three. <laughs> Very good question. We now use beta. <laughs> beta alpha, beta inverse, is beta alpha beta is minus alpha. Whence beta m, beta inverse, is minus m since m is linear in the alphas. And <coughs> beta L, beta inverse, is plus L. Since beta is um, um, since uh, L is bilinear in the alphas. has two alphas, and therefore you get two minus signs. Therefore, beta it can be used to define a parity operation. This representation we have is similar 
is equivalent to its parity transform. Now, this one is not equivalent to its parity transform. This one is not equivalent to its parity transform. This one is. going to the standard basis, the vial basis for this representation. The alphas must be the generators of Lorentz transformations times a factor of 2 minus 2i. And alpha is sigma minus sigma, 0, 0, if we adopt the standard basis for this representation. Beta <coughs> must be a matrix that anti-commutes with alpha. And the only possibility for beta is, <coughs> therefore, 0, some number, what will I call it, lambda, um, mm, let's see, it's got to be purely off diagonal. So it's lambda, lambda inverse 0. The lambda and lambda inverse are there, so beta squared will be 1. Otherwise, lambda could be anything. Any questions? That that's the unique beta that anti-commutes with alpha. If it had an on-diagonal entry, it would not anti that would not anti-commute with alpha. And these two off-diagonal entries have to be inverses. Yes? I said, by choosing a standard basis for the representation 0, 1 half plus 1 half 0, we choose alpha to be of this form. Then I say beta must anti-commute with the alphas. Well, that's pretty easy. It's got to be an off-diagonal thing. Off-diagonal thing is what anti-commutes with the alphas. And then since the square has got to be 1, the off-diagonal entries have to be inversely related. I'm not assuming alpha and beta are, are in the first instance Hermitian. Now I make a uh, further similarity transformation, or equivalence transformation. Sorry, the proof is long. I just wrote it down on, on one sheet of paper. But I said, obviously, now I'm having to work out the steps. <laughs> um, Inverse, beta goes into inverse, where I choose S to be lambda 0, 0, 1. And by elementary multiplication, this doesn't do a darn thing to alpha. It's still sigma minus sigma. 0, 0, but it turns beta into which is the desirable result. Do I have that right? Well, check it. Maybe the lambda's down here and the 1 is up there. One or the other will do the job. QED, this proves this theorem. And it has practically put me to sleep. I don't know about you. <laughs> so the, now, what is the point of the theorem? Well, one of the points of the theorem, what is the use of the theorem, is that if we want to write down the Dirac matrices or the Dirac equation in some uh, crazy basis, we don't really have to go through the problem of constructing this matrix S and seeing what it is. We can, if we can write down four alphas, four matrices that obey these equations, we will be guaranteed that those four matrices uh, will be connected to our original four matrices by some s. Uh, secondly, more important, it uh, 
emphasizes something. It emphasizes that a lot of people did complicated computations in the early 30s involving spin one-half particles that involved explicitly writing down the four components of the solutions of the Dirac equation to evaluate matrix elements of scatter for scattering processes were uh, somehow doing a harder and more elaborate computation than they needed to. The whole thing is in the anti-commutation algebra of the Dirac matrices. And therefore, there shouldn't be any need to write down explicit expressions for the solution of the Dirac equation. We should be able to get the whole thing by abstract algebraic, uh, any desired computation, by abstract algebraic manipulations just involving the properties of the Dirac matrices embodied in those four anti-commutation relations. And that gives us an important clue about the direction in which we should try and develop things. We should always try, whenever it's convenient, to develop algorithms that will enable us to handle the Dirac equation in a basis-independent way. Because messy as the anti-commutation relations are, they're a lot less messier than working with explicit 4 by 4 matrices. And the whole structure of the thing is in those anti-commutation relations. I will now, well, I will if I have the material. Yeah, here it is. I will now go through the last half hour developing a formalism that exploits the fullest this observation, a formalism invented by Pauli, in which one sets things up in such a way so that all Lorentz transformation structures of uh, bilinear forms or more complicated forms in the uh, Dirac fields are uh, expressed in an extremely simple way where we can explore a lot of things just using the algebra of the Dirac matrices. In the homework problems, one of the two homework problems has you develop some identities that follow just from the algebra of the Dirac matrices. And the other homework problem has you work out one thing explicitly in terms of four explicit components, so you can see how ugly that can be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. The, um, so the remainder of this particular lecture will be on a notational scheme invented by Pauli and later automated even further by Feynman. <coughs> that enables one to do Dirac algebra as painlessly as possible. <laughs> Which is unfortunately not absolutely painlessly. That still is a big help over writing down explicit 4 by 4 matrices. This notational scheme is keyed to a restricted set of uh, Dirac bases. We will always assume in the sequel that we are working in a basis where the four Dirac matrices are all Hermitian. If the scheme can be cons extended to other kinds of bases, but it's just not worth it. This is rich enough for our purposes. It includes, of course, both the vial representation and the standard representation. <coughs> the first step is to define a somewhat peculiar version of the adjoint. The psi adjoint beta is defined to be psi bar and is called to the rack adjoint. Um, the reason for this is that your scalar operator, remember we had a scalar field, the mass term in the, uh, in the uh, Dirac Lagrangian, which is psi adjoint beta psi. That doesn't look, that looks sort of grotesque as a scalar operator. It's of course equal to psi bar psi, <laughs> which looks much more sensible as to what a scalar should be. When we define a new adjoint of a, um, uh, for a uh, vector, we of course would like to define a new adjunction operation for operators also. In particular, we would like to define an operation a bar such that a psi, where a is any 4 by 4 matrix, 
bar equals psi bar a bar, just like for the ordinary adjoint. The obvious answer is a bar equals beta a adjoint beta. Thus, this defines the Dirac adjoint of a 4x4 four four matrix A. The uh, Lorentz matrices that affect Lorentz transformations, the D of lambdas, or D1, one, one, oops, the D1 half, one half of lambdas, but I'll just call them D of lambdas, have nice properties under Dirac barring. Psi goes into D1 one half, one half of lambda, uh, not one half, one half, sorry, D of lambda, psi, under a Lorentz transformation, lambda, where D is here, or I should say as a sum matrix, depending on what basis we're using. That's equivalent to D1 half 0 plus D0 1 half. <clears throat> Psi bar, of course, taking the bar of this, the bar of lambda. From the fact that Psi bar Psi is a scalar and Psi is arbitrary, we deduce it also show it directly. That, can erase, we deduce that I had a, done a terrible job of erasing this point. <laughs> that, thus although our D of lambda are not unitary, they are Dirac unitary, quote unquote. That is to say, they do not preserve the conventional quadratic form, the sum of the squares, as a unitary matrix does, but they preserve this unconventional quadratic form, the sum of two squares and the difference of two others. 